start the second session. My name is Hermona Sorek, and I'm from the Science Campus in the Hebrew University's uh, Faculty of Science. And I'm very pleased to present our first speaker for this session, Dr. Elizabeth Peel, from the School of Life and Health Sciences in Ashton University at Birmingham, UK. Please. Thank you very much. Um, we'll all now be slipping into the post-perandial dip, so I will try to be as lively and engaging as I possibly can. I'm going to shift the focus slightly um, in my talk to really think about ethical issues from the perspective of those people, those healthy volunteers who are taking part in neuroimaging research. And before I do so, I just want to thank you very much for inviting me. It really is an honor and a pleasure to be back in Jerusalem. I was last here in, um, to not quite the song, the summer of 69, but it was actually the summer of 1993, so 16 years ago, and it really is absolutely delightful to be back. So thank you very much for inviting me. Okay, this is what I'm going to cover. First of all, I want to contextualize this particular research project for you and then I'm going to kind of quickly trot through the kinds of things that we found um, when we conducted some empirical research looking at participants experience of neuroimaging techniques particularly MEG and fMRI techniques and this was research that we carried out in 2005-06 then I want to outline some of the ethical and also the procedural implications. And of course, those two things aren't mutually exclusive. And I want to briefly talk about some of the potential recommendations that come out of this piece of research for furthering our understanding of the place of brain imaging within contemporary culture and how we experience those sorts of techniques as a culture. Now, as I said, this research was with healthy volunteers, but hopefully, um, I think as you'll see as I go along, I think there are links and, and ways that we can extrapolate from this experience, potentially to the experiences of people with neurodegenerative conditions or people with cognitive impairments. So if you keep those sorts of people in your mind while I'm talking about you know, normal people, then hopefully we can start to see some of the connections with respect to that. Okay, now in terms of background and context, I'm a psychologist, and specifically I'm a critical psychologist. And what I mean by that is two things. Critical psychology is critical of the traditional mainstream methods of experimental psychology and positivism, um, those are the kinds of things that critical psychologists take issue with. The other thing that, that critical psychologists are interested in is trying to affect positive social change. So taking issue with the way and the apparatus of, of psychology that has often been used in the past, often to the detriment of marginalised and vulnerable groups of people, and trying to think about ways in which we can use psychological knowledge to support, help, give voice to, um, and, and improve the lives of, of groups of people who are marginalized for all sorts of different reasons. So that, that's kind of broadly where I'm coming from. And most of my research involves examining patients' experiences, um, taking what people themselves think and feel seriously and try and then feed that into... Um, research and also clinical practice and the way that health services are delivered. That's kind of my, my raison d'etre. Now, within this particular study, we were interested in the research participants' experience. And if I contextualize this in terms of my particular university, Aston University in psychology, within Aston, psychology has historically been synonymous with neuroimaging. That's what it's known for. So when I joined that organization seven years ago, I was a member of the Neurosciences Research Institute. That no longer exists. We reconfigured things, but, but it's got a big place in the kind of work that we do at Aston. 
And very recently, um, we've received external and internal funding um, to launch what's called the ABC, the Aston Brain Centre, which brings together existing facilities, um, particularly around MEG studies and also MRI studies. And the idea here is to try and use new technologies, particularly an MEG scanner that's designed for use with children, um, so it can tolerate um, kids moving around in the scanner, um, and it doesn't degrade the image. And I think, so my neuroscientist colleagues tell me, that will be, I think it's the first one in the world, this, this very fancy piece of kit. So there's a lot of excitement um, in my organisation around the potential for these new technologies and their, fo their focus is very translational. Um, so working from um, the study of neurodevelopment in health and illness and translate the applications of fundamental neurophysiological research to clinical service provision. And we have colleagues and connections that, that span that range. So um, I think that you know, the, the fundamental is trying to improve people's lives here. Now, in terms of this particular research that I'm going to talk to you about, um, there was a group of us that got interested in this. Um, so there was myself, um, there was a cognitive neuroscientist, and two health psychologists, one of whom has quantitative expertise and one of whom has qualitative expertise. And as I hope you'll see bringing together this grouping of people, I think, was quite helpful in terms of, of what we found out. Now, as, as I said, I'm a critical psychologist and I do qualitative work. That's not to say I don't appreciate the value of numbers for some things, um, but with, with some caution. Okay. Now, I think it's fair to say that we know relatively little, actually, about how participants themselves experience fMRI and or... MEG scanning procedures. There, there's been some research. There was a study by Walter and colleagues in the early 2000s which looked at transcranial magnetic stimulation. And this was in the context of patients with clinical depression. And what we wanted to do was extend this literature, um, thinking about ways in which we can improve the experience for research participants and as in an ongoing way for, um, for, for patients, um, people with conditions. Another study that was conducted looked at um, the kind of role an information booklet would provide in people's experience of having an MRI scan. And this was with neurology patients. And what they found was people were more likely to report that they knew what was going on, and it increased their confidence level in the staff that were administering the procedure, and they also felt less isolated. One of the interesting things that Bayard et al. found was that women, when they used standard psychometric assessments of anxiety, it was women that were coming out as having higher anxiety scores than men. Um, but what they conclude as a, as, a, as a result of that study was that if you provide an information booklet, it's both cost effective, it's easy to roll out, and it's... It, they suggested it was an acceptable way of reducing anxiety in patients undergoing MRI. So that's just a bit of background. In terms of our work, we did a number of different things. Um, our first element to this was to conduct a survey looking at people who'd undergone this range of neuroimaging techniques. So this was a post-scan survey asking them to reflect back on the, on the process and what, what they thought about it. We also did a series of follow-up interviews with a, a proportion of these questionnaire respondents to explore in a little bit more depth their experiences. The follow-up interviews were with people who were, I suppose, veteran um, experiences of, of neuroimaging techniques. They weren't new to it. They'd experienced it before. Um, in the pre and post interviews, so we, we, we spoke to people before and after. Um, this was an anatomical um, brain scan in an MRI scanner, so it was quite a short five-minute scan. Um, these were all people that were new to the procedure. They hadn't experienced it before. And it's these data that I'm going to focus on, although I will touch a little bit on the other two studies. So in terms of our findings, um, the key message from the survey was that generally 
it was viewed as a positive experience by research participants. Although there was some confusion expressed about how to exit the scanner if they became uncomfortable. The way that it operates is that people are given a, a kind of a, a button, a panic button, if you like, and if they become anxious or agitated when they're in the bore of the scanner, they can press that and then somebody will come and get them out. And there was some uncertainty around that particular element of the process. In terms of the follow-up interviews, um, one of the things that came out quite strongly was the unease that some women expressed with the male-dominatedness of the scanning experience and the setting. So one woman said, when I, when I went, it was a bit daunting because it was just me with three blokes. Um, another woman said, having to take your bra off, and especially with the Meg one, because they didn't even have, because with the fMRI, they've got lockers. I was wearing some jumper that was quite tight, and I suddenly thought, oh, blooming heck. I've got to take my bra off, and I'd have worn something looser if I'd have known. So there's actually kind of embodied experiential elements of this process that, you know, if a woman's wearing an under, underwire bra and she goes into the scanner, she will be drawn to the bore. It, you know, it has to come off. That, that kind of thing can't be worn. And yet these women at this particular point in time didn't, didn't know this was coming. They didn't know to expect this as part of the experience. And for some of them, it was... It was uncomfortable, actually, being asked to do that in that kind of context. There was also some misunderstanding around the purpose and the nature of the scan. And there was also some anxiety or, well, something you could label as anxiety around fears of identifying problems or potentially identifying problems. So if we follow up a few of these themes in the follow-up interviews... One of the things that came out was the fact that actually this is an ongoing interaction between the experimenter and the subject. And people were very sensitized to the fact that in this particular context, I'm talking now about in the MRI scanning room, they were in the scanner, the researchers behind the screen, but they're very conscious of their relationship to that person and how the technologies used can either create or reduce anxieties around that interaction. So if we look at what this participant says, they say they all went into this funny little room, but I could see them all on the, um, the little mirror thing. So I could see what they were doing. So when they were pulling funny faces, I did get a little bit worried. So what the person is doing is interpreting, and in this case, presumably misinterpreting what's going on between her and, and the experimenter. Another person said, from a participant's point of view, it didn't unnerve me that I couldn't see them because I knew there was always verbal contact. If I said anything, they could hear me. So here we've got like visual contact versus verbal contact. The visual is actually troubling for this particular participant, but the verbal is actually reassuring for another participant. So that kind of contact and how people are interacting within the setting is an important thing to consider. And of course, these are health-related technologies and they are mediating the interaction between people, but it's still a human experience. Um, and I think this is something that we need to be very mindful of. Another per participant said, it's not like you're in there and they've gone off to have a cup of tea. You know, the fact that they're there and they're part of this is really important in terms of the way that people are experiencing it. Another issue that came up in the follow-up interviews or a question that we started to think about was whether the way that people were talking about the experience was actually indicating some kind of latent anxiety. Now, remember, these are healthy people and really they shouldn't have anything to worry about when they're engaging in these techniques and processes, or whether actually this anxiety is and should be normative. And, and what I mean by that is that we, don't, we, don't, we can't see our brains. They inhabit our heads, and they're not a part of the body that's very intelligible to us. They're, they're hard to kind of visualise and they're hard to see. So perhaps because this is brought to the fore by these very visual technologies, it does kind of create that kind of anxiety. It's like bringing a bit of the body um, that we don't understand or we don't recognise. Say, for example, if you have diabetes, 
very often, unless your blood sugars are very, very high or very, very low, you're not experiencing those fluctuations in blood glucose levels. It's only when you use a blood glucose meter and it tells you in black and white on the screen what's going on with your blood sugar levels that it becomes real and visible to you. It's not experienced. So let's look at some of the data. It was literally uh, this bit is here, this bit is here kind of thing. You know, there were no enormous tumours, hopefully, um, that sort of thing. So, yeah. Fingers crossed, everything's all right. There's always going to be a level of apprehension or maybe a little nervousness. Not, I wouldn't have said it was, oh, I was scared or petrified. I wouldn't have rated it at that kind of level of anxiety. The funny thing is, I actually didn't even think about it. I really didn't think, ooh, there might be something abnormal here, um, which is a bit odd. So there's this idea that there's a certain level of anxiety or apprehension or uncertainty about what these techniques could potentially reveal about somebody's brain is actually an ordinary normative part of the experience because we don't know, we can't see them. If we focus on the pre and post interviews now, in the pre-scan we were interested in issues that related to their knowledge of MRI, so their previous knowledge, whether that be from the media, whether it be from family or friends who'd experienced the techniques, and what they imagined it would be like having the brain scan. So we're kind of asking them to project forward here, never having personally experienced it before. With the post-scan, obviously, we're asking them to describe the encounter that they had, what was said, how it was said, what happened to their body, what happened to their brain, what does it mean to them now they've had that experience. So there was some kind of you know, comparing and contrasting in terms of the before and after. Now, let me just give you a few in details about the participants. As you can see, there's not very many of them. They're all women. They're all relatively young, they're predominantly white British, and these were basically students drawn from a, from a psychology group. So, you know, one would hope <laughs> that they would have some kind of interest uh, in, in, in how the brain works and how it kind of impacts on things. You would hope, you know, touch wood. Um, so it's, it's what... A, I think when we think about the, what these findings mean, we, all, we, we really do need to think about the fact that this is a, a limited, fairly bounded sample. It's not, it's not very heterogeneous. It's quite homogeneous in terms of the kinds of people we were talking to. And it may well be with other ages, in other contexts, different issues would be salient. But that doesn't negate the fact that these were issues for these particular um, people, these participants. So what were the themes we identified? Well, there were four main themes. One was connected to the anticipation of the experience. One was connected to expectations of diagnosis or clean bill of health. So there's kind of a tension there. The third one was around submitting to what people very much perceived as a medicalised context, even though this was, is within a, a research context in a university. It's not a medical context, but those medical associations are very real and very vivid for people. And also there's this issue of the fact that it's, it's first and foremost, it's a bodily encounter. You're subjecting your body to this technique and this experience. So here's a quote. I'm just interested in finding out what my brain looks like and stuff like that. So I'm more interested and sort of curious. So initially what we saw was a, a real kind of level of, 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 of curiosity, of interest, wondering what it will be like to see this bit of your body that you can't see, you don't see. Um, some people talked about Maybe, maybe it would be different from other people's. W would it be the same as everybody else's? Which bits of it would be lighting up? This, this kind of sense of intrigue and, and curiosity. 
this participant also said, I suppose I'm feeling quite nervous because I don't know what to expect. But on the other hand, I'm quite excited because I've never seen one of these scanners, so it's quite exciting in that aspect. But yeah, I'll be fine. I'm happy with it. So on the one hand, there's curiosity and interest. On the other hand, there's, there's nervousness, there's excitement. People are in a kind of, you know, a heightened state of kind of arousal and engagement with this because it is novel and because it is new and because they don't quite know what they're going to anticipate. Joe says, I'm a little bit worried because I don't know whether I'd like panic whether I was, when I was inside or something, because obviously once you're inside, you're, there's not really a lot you can do. You're stuck. So there's this sense of... Um, I mean, often people use quite vivid imagery around a kind of um, being in a coffin or casket... Um, being enclosed. It's, it's, it's a particular kind of experience that has lots of associations for people. Um, so she was, she was worried about potentially panicking in there. In terms of expectations of a diagnosis or a clean bill of health, as Nina says, I'm not so nervous. I think I might be a bit not now, but in my post-scan interview, I might be able to hear them whispering, oh, there's something wrong there or something like that. So prior to having the scan, there's this sense that something might be found. There might be something going on. I don't quite know what's going to, what, what, what's going to happen with respect to this. Another participant said, I was a bit nervous because I said, if you find anything abnormal, you have to tell me. And I was a bit nervous in case they said, in case they found anything. And then the scanner said, we do pass on pass it on if we find anything. So now I'm thinking, I hope nobody contacts me. So again, it's about how incidental findings are managed. There's a you know, very clear policy around if something is picked up on a scan, then that information will be passed to that person's general practitioner and they will then get in touch to take it further. But there's this kind of holding bay, waiting period, where this person who was in a scanner for five minutes... Um, as part of a study that was designed to look at how people experienced it, was then thinking, oh gosh, am I going to get a letter from my GP? And am, am I going to be contacted? Now, if we compare this to those kind of veteran participants who would have been in the, in the, into the scanner before, they, they had a kind of slightly different take on this. So, they said things like, well, it was just interesting to see yourself in a, in a totally different unknown angle, you know, that you've never seen before. And you think, well, that's my brain, and it fills up the whole of my head. So there was more this kind of sense of wonder, the way that, way that the brain is. Um, somebody else says it's quite weird, but quite nice to see your brain on the screen. Another person says, as soon as, as soon as it involves the brain in any way, people will be nervous. And I think that's quite a quite an important point that that particular participant articulated. There's also this issue of submitting to a medicalised context. So as Nina says, it portrays the image of you going into hospital and going into the scan to see if something is wrong with you. And then they could turn around and say, oh yeah, there is something wrong. And then I think it's just, I just think it's that. It's the whole image it portrays. So it was inextricably linked in the way that people articulated this to a medicalised setting. Um, again, the, the, the more veteran experiences of, of this particular neuroimaging technique were saying things like, in terms of doing an experiment, there's no stigma attached to that. It's not like you would say, I've had an MRI scan, and people would go, oh, you must have a disease or something. So, so for them, they were quite clearly differentiating this research context and a medicalised context, and they were able to do that. Whereas for these people experiencing it for the first time, it was completely infused and intermeshed. They weren't separating those things out. Another person said, my partner's father, who had it for medical reasons and hadn't enjoyed it one bit, and I think that was the bit that made me a bit more apprehensive than anything. So again, people were drawing on their experiences of family members who'd experienced this particular technique for a medical reason and thinking that's going to impact on my experience of this. Generally speaking, the way people talked about this, they extrapolated that if they, if they were having this for a clinical reason, 
they would have been more nervous. That was their projection of, of the experience for people who were in a patient category rather than a healthy volunteer category. Another quote, it's a bit like being at the dentist when you're, you're in the same sort of, although you're lying down, it's a bit, it's like being in a dentist chair, you're sort of stuck there. So there was a lot of analogies drawn between this kind of um, experience and other kind of medicalised experiences where you as an individual aren't in control um, and you need to be relatively passive and relatively restrained. So you know, if you think of the kind of things that happen when we're in the dentist chair, um, it's kind of invasive in terms of what's going on in, with your mouth, you're kind of lying back, um, often with a bright light in your eyes. And people were making those kinds of comparators in relation to this experience. People very much talked about it as a bodily encounter. So Dawn says, it's the unknown really, not knowing exactly what I was going to expect because nobody said. They gave me a full overview of exactly what would happen. I mean, I was told I would have to lie down and I'd be going into this machine thing and there would be loud noise, but I didn't know what to expect actually being in there. That was all really. I think if I'd have done it loads of times before, then I wouldn't have felt that, but you know. So this is after a very clear kind of description of precisely what's going to happen. There's this sense that actually you need to experientially have that knowledge in order to understand what the process is about. A verbal description isn't, isn't sufficient. So I think to summarise this, MRI scanning for these participants very much had medical connotations and it kind of invokes patient practitioner roles and this idea of submitting your body to a, a procedure and a process. And it's very much a bodily encounter. So I think one of the things that, that we found from undertaking this research that the preparatory work around MRI particularly needs to be a preparation for the senses. It needs to be something that's holistic, that prepares body and soul. Um, now if we think about the implications for neuroethics, clearly um, some... MRI research participants can become anxious and we need to think about that and take that into account quite seriously when we're either conducting research or indeed um, clinical work. And it's possible um, that the, the potential outcome and the management of, of possible incidental finding, findings needs a clearer um, outline, it needs more clarification. Participants need to know Research participants need to know it's not a diagnostic scan and what the implications of that are. There's also an issue around clarity of terms. Um, the face-to-face -face encounter between the researcher or experimenter and the participant is clearly a lot more valuable um, and, is, and is important during consent procedures rather than having a written consent form that people work through. There needs to be some dialogue around that. And clearly written information isn't enough. Um, a virtual tour of a scanner prior to going in it, um, being taken round the equipment would be valuable. Um, in fact, one of the participants said there was somebody else being scanned before me, so I had to sort of wait for that to happen, which in some ways was nice because obviously, you know, he didn't explode or die, so, you know, which was kind of reassuring. So, so people want that sense of this, this is what's going to happen and actually this is going to be okay for me. And participants themselves suggested you know, it would be a good idea to have a short video clip so people can experience it virtually before experiencing it in reality. Certainly we didn't find that the procedure itself um, induced claustrophobia and in fact a lot of participants talked about it being relaxing and kind of falling asleep once they were actually in the bore and they were horizontal, um, despite the loud noises. Um, but we did have um, one of these small group of participants who had a panic attack prior to going in the scanner. This was somebody who um, does suffer from panic attacks. This wasn't kind of her first panic attack experience. But she, and she was very distressed in the post-scan interview because she really wanted to help. She really wanted to take part in the project, but she actually just physically 
um, panicked when she was in the room in the scanner and she just couldn't go in it. So there are issues around that. And I think, I think it's easy to think if you are a patient, then those issues will be more salient. But these are, you know, young, <coughs> excuse me, psychology students who, again, experience the procedure as, as, as quite frightening in some cases. So in terms of future research, I think one of the things that we'd like to explore is look at the ways in which procedures that are employed in academic settings and medical settings, kind of examine those and, and look at the ways in which the boundaries between those settings are, are blurred and what can be learned from the ways that things operate in those two settings that could enhance people's experiences of the procedures. I think we need more work to establish whether participants are becoming anxious prior to scans and what could be done to um, potentially alleviate that. I mean, I'm not suggesting that people should be um, given, necessarily given kind of meditation techniques or, or, or sedatives or, or those sorts of things, but in some cases that might actually be very valuable, um, particularly given that, that movement really affects the quality of the image and that's something that's very concerning for newer images. We also want to evaluate um, the new developments that are happening at our institution, so the Aston Brain Centre, as I mentioned, in ways that we can create more of a person-centred approach to managing the experience of scanning, particularly for children. Um, as I said, this MEG scanner will cope with movement in a way that, that usual MEG scanners can't. And of course, you know, my colleagues' interest is looking at epilepsy in children and, and, um, and, and, and neuro, neuro, neurological problems that affect ch children and, and, and our issues in childhood. But we can see lots of ways in which that would be useful for people with older people with neurodegenerative disease that struggle to keep still. So, for example, somebody with dementia um, whose cognitive abilities aren't fantastic actually negotiating and explaining to somebody that they need to, to keep still can be incredibly challenging and incredibly difficult. But with this kind of technological advance, that's going to shift the terrain slightly um, and people will be able to, to move around. We're also interested in looking at this issue longitudinally. So if we were looking at patients' experiences, which is something that we would like to do, um, we would want to take it through, through the process um, and see at what, what points these techniques are salient in terms of the people's lived experience of their disease and the disease progression. At what point does it not become viable? So, for example, if you have somebody with a dementia who, you know, a scan would be viable, but they would need to be sedated in order to go into it because they find it so discomforting. Where do we, where do we draw the line there? How do we negotiate that? Is, is, the, is the, the, the clinical and technological benefit of having that image, does that outweigh the discomfort of the person in situ at that point? And these are, these are thorny um, and difficult issues without any easy solutions, but it was some, certainly something that we want to explore. And we want to look at how different neuroimaging techniques are embedded in people's experience of, of living with a condition. Does it change and shape the way that people think about their neurogenitive, neurodegenerative condition? Does it affect their sense of self? Um, does it change the way that they think about themselves and see themselves when they gain access to um, these images? Now, I hope that you can see some of the similarities and differences between the neuroethical issues in relation to this study and um, for those people with patient groups with neurodegenerative problems. And I hope that I've persuaded you of the value of, of listening quite carefully um, and analysing the perspectives of those people who are at the sharp end at, uh, or at the receiving end of neuroimaging techniques and hopefully we can learn a lot from their experiences in terms of making our techniques more tolerable um, and 
making it a more pleasant experience for people. And, of course, I would like to thank my colleagues at Aston and the British Academy for supporting this work. Thank you. than they did for the patient so, uh, people. Yeah, I mean, it, it wasn't a comparative um, study. I should be behind here. It wasn't a comparative study. Um, but certainly in terms of the procedural elements, in terms of the way that consent is gained, in terms of the kinds of processes around removing metal objects, do you have any tattoos, um, all those sorts of questions prior to going in the scanner, they, there's not much variability in that, in those procedural elements between somebody who's being in there for the purposes of research and a patient. But yes, of course, I think the tone and probably the work that the scanners and the radiologists do with the patient group would be more in depth. Yeah. So, of course, uh, fMRI is a unique physical experience, like you've mentioned, and people express these kind of anxieties about just the physical being of being in a small, tight place and being lying down, but uh, you did mention a lot of other anxieties people express, which I think that a lot of people that uh, deal with psychology uh, might encounter them irrespective of the fMRI experience. So, for example, a lot of people have this belief that if I go talk to a clinical psychologist, then just this conversation might, you know, who knows what this person might uh, uh, learn about me and what they know that I don't, I'm not even aware of and stuff like that. So I was just wondering if you feel that the anxieties raised in the context of fMRI are unique to fMRI and they're above and beyond this normal anxiety that we see in all psychological research or is it just a spectrum of it? I think, I think it's a different, it is a different context and it's a novel context um, for people who've not experienced it before. But yes, I would agree. There are, there, are, there are clearly similarities with the way that you know, lay people engage with the experts across a whole range of different dis disciplines and specialties. Um, and I think that, that varies in all sorts of different ways. I think obviously with this group, they're students and they were being scanned by the people that educate them. So there's that kind of dynamic as well. There's an assumption that there's no, more knowledge than, than there is. I mean, actually, in terms of the anatomical scan, I don't, you know, n nobody with the expertise actually really properly examined them. That wasn't the focus. The focus was on the experience, but because of the nature of the experience, it was kind of extrapolated that they would have more knowledge and power, actually, than, than people did. And I think that probably goes back to what we were talking about before lunch around kind of lay understandings of science and the kind of power that's imbued to that kind of knowledge and that kind of expertise. Uh, thank you. Uh, did you have the, the opportunity to perform the same studies with children? Not yet. This, this technology is not yet in place, but I think it would be fascinating um, to, to speak to kids before the scan and after um, and, and, and learn what they're taking from the experience yeah. because it may well, I mean the, the MEG scanner again, I mean people talk about it as a giant hair dryer, you know it has a different kind of cultural resonance than, than, the, than, than the bore of the, the MRI scanner so because it'd be that great. Would be important for deciding whether to allow such procedures with children as controls in studies. Yes, absolutely. Um, I was just wondering if you could answer this. It may be um, not politically correct, but um, in the UK, there has been a drive both by many academic unions and also the labor unions to, to sort of boycott Israel. Now, those who want to boycott Israel, do they con would they continue using the MRI and all the uh, medical advances that were advanced by, by Israel? Or would they also boycott all the advances in, in medical technology and so forth that Israel has uh, given to the world? I would say that this is an um, 
Can, can I just say I, I don't know? I'd like to thank you for this uh, refreshing lecture because I haven't come across many talks from this subject's perspective, which mm. I think is very important. And, uh, and that was really illuminating and interesting. And the second thing is to maybe to um, note upon the previous person who asked about it, people's anxiety. And I, you know, just from meeting the subjects, I came across people who mainly people who didn't have any biology or psychology uh, background that actually had a feeling of um, um, being, they, their minds are being read. As if, mm. you know, the, the experiment knows mm. what I'm thinking mm. now, which is uh, uh, far, I think, beyond what people may experience in any other uh, therapeutic setting mm. or medical setting. So I, I think that's, um, that's an, uh, a unique and, and interesting experience that um, uh, I guess uh, you may be able to relate to. But um, beyond that, I had two more questions. One is that uh, a problem that I came across when I was uh, debriefing my uh, subjects before uh, the experiment, I was inviting them to, uh, to participate, and um, they had questions about the long-term effects of, of, of fMRI, mm. and fMRI has been used for the most for uh, two decades, I think. Mm. So there hasn't been a longitudinal study, you know, searching for the really long-term uh, effects of that. And as far as I know, there, there isn't a conclusive uh, uh, um, uh, information about that. So if you could relate to that, and like if, if that's something that came up in, in the uh, 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 interviews or, or, you know, the concerns that uh, people had, and, and the other thing is the, the issue of, of the clinical uh, population, which I think uh, that could be made by extra extrapolation from the normal population uh, subjects. But I think there's a major difference because multi subjects come from the uh, psychology uh, department, and or you know they they have some curiosity and some enthusiasm about how their brain looks and how the you know the processes they've studied on how uh, it actually takes place in the brain, whereas uh, with patients, I think the picture is sometimes different because uh, the, the MRI and the fMRI experience is presented as something that is part of their treatment. And they are asked to give their consent. They are not forced to do that, but it's, it's a different setting. And sometimes their, you know, their um, voluntarily will, voluntary will to participate is, is, is um, uh, much more limited. And, and I think that's a major difference, and if you could relate to that as well. Mm. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I agree with everything you said. I, th I think one of the reasons perhaps why in this particular group of participants we didn't find this sense of concern about the longer-term potential implications was because it was a youngish group of people. And I think, by and large, I think as we get older, we start to worry about the... You know, the, you know, there's a sense when you're young that you're kind of invulnerable, and and um, you know, you you know, you ha there's this sense of kind of um, being invincible. And I think if it had been a different group of research participants, that I think probably would have come out. Uh, I'm speculating, but I, I, c I could see why why people would um, have have those potential concerns and anxieties. Um, what I, one of the studies that I would like to see done is a comparative study looking at groups of um, people that are undergoing these kind of techniques for a medical investigation with you know, the view to that this will help them as individuals by undergoing this compared to um, research participants who are maybe interested, maybe curious, you know, as we hope psychology students are about these kind of things. But there's nothing intrinsically in it, in it for them. Um, but then having said that, I've, I've spent a lot of time speaking to research participants um, who've been involved in qualitative research and very often what people say is um, they understand that it's not of direct benefit to them but 
they see kind of altruism as an important part of it. And actually, I'm not sure... I think it's more complicated than this type of people think X and this type of people think Y. And it may well be in clinical settings people feel, well, if I'm involved in this, particularly if it is more experimental um, types of techniques, that it would have a, you know, a greater good. It might not actually benefit me. And I think, again, that's where we need to be careful about thinking about more mainstream neuroimaging um, techniques and the more kind of controversial or experimental ones. And again, that's another variable in a much bigger and much more comprehensive study. Thank you. Thank you very much.